Welcome to Vox Diversity. I'm Vox Day, and today I'm talking about immigration and war. About two years ago, I had the good fortune to talk to Martin Van Kreveld. He's the Israeli military historian, and he's one of the great minds of military history and military strategy. Dr. Jerry Pornell has even described him as a necessary addendum to Clausewitz. So this is a man who really knows what he's talking about. And I was interested at the time in finding out whether my idea that there was a link between immigration and war was correct. And I figured if there was anybody who knew this, it would be Dr. Van Krebel. We were working on a book called There Will Be War, Volume 10. And I was looking to find a really good essay on the subject. And so I talked to him. He agreed that it would make an interesting paper. Much to my surprise, when he came back with the, the completed paper a few months later, he reached a conclusion that was very different than the thesis I had proposed. What he said was that functionally there was no difference between immigration and war. That essentially the two phenomena are two different sides of the same coin. This seemed really strange to me. You know, we don't think about the phenomenon of war and the phenomenon of immigration as even really being in the same category. And yet when you think about it, what is the ultimate purpose of war? What is the usual outcome of a successful war? Prefer to be captured or destroyed. When we think about war, we tend to think about killing people. We tend to think about the destruction of the battlefield. But really, that's not necessarily true. If you look at the successful wars of Nazi Germany, most of the countries that they defeated, they did so without very much bloodshed. When they overran Holland, when they conquered Norway, when they conquered Belgium, even the, the war for France was, you know, compared to World War I and, and other wars, relatively bloodless. And yet, we wouldn't dream of considering those various wars to not have been military conquests. So the actual outcome of a war is a change in the ruler. It's a change in who governs whom. And if you look at the history of migration, if you look at the recent history of immigration, especially in a democratic system, exactly the same objective is accomplished. The rulers change. The governing principles change. And so when we, when we start to look at it from that perspective, suddenly we begin to see that immigration and war are closely akin. You know, not in how they take place, but in what the consequences are. Now, this discussion, it goes all the way back to Thucydides and the history of the Peloponnesian War. He actually theorized that one reason Attica became the most significant and powerful area of Greece was because Athens was agriculturally poor. And so the rest of the territory around there tended to be warred over by invading and migrating tribes, by different kingdoms, by different, by different peoples passing through. The constant battling over the more fertile lands caused lots and lots of refugees to take refuge in Athens. And as a result, Athens became one of the most populous cities in Greece, and it eventually caused them to develop an empire because a lot of these new citizens of Athens were accustomed to looking beyond the city walls. And so we see there is an intrinsic link between immigration and war, both coming and going. Because once Athens became imperial, obviously, it began engaging in more wars and different kinds of wars, and eventually wars that brought the city down. Another example of the link between immigration and war, we can see in Caesar. What triggered the conquest of Gaul was actually a failed migration by the Helvetii people who were attempting to escape from the pressure that was being put on them by the Germans, but they weren't permitted to enter the territory of Rome. Then Caesar uh, defeated them in battle, and after that, 
uh, he turned his attention to Gaul, ended up defeating all of the southern Gaulish tribes, and actually enslaved over a million of them. Not an animal. No, no, no. Once more, we see it coming and going, because those slaves then became immigrants into the Roman Empire. But the most significant link between immigration and war is something called the Volkswanderung. It's the movement of peoples. It was 400 years of people consistently moving from east to west and from north to south because of wars that were taking place and movements of peoples that were taking place in the east. So for 400 years, we saw all of these tribes, all of these kingdoms constantly moving, invaded and put under pressure of war in their homelands, and then in turn doing the same to other peoples. And so that's why the, the maps that we see today, the names of the regions that we see today were actually formed by this combination of migration and war. Your emperor is pleased to give you the barbarian war. One of the troubling things that we see when we study this is that you know, we're accustomed to the idea that civilized societies always find it easier to de militarily defeat more primitive societies. But actually, that's a relatively recent development. My history is a little hazy, Cassius. But shouldn't the barbarians lose the Battle of Carthage? The most significant example is one that you're all familiar with, of course, which is the sack of Rome by the Visigoths, Alaric sacking Rome in 410 uh, AD. But what a lot of people don't realize is that this was actually the result of immigration. Even worse, it was the result of the Roman Emperor Valens taking pity on refugees. What had happened 38 years before was that the Huns had been pushing west. They nearly wiped out a people called the Alans. And after that, they attacked the Eastern Goths, or the Ostrogoths, and defeated and enslaved them. Now, the Ostrogoths were pagan, and so they were a little less reluctant to become a part of the Hunnish Empire. But the Visigoths, who were the Western Goths, were mostly Christian, and they were much less inclined to allow themselves to come under Hunnish rule. The problem was they couldn't retreat because the Danube River, which served as the northern border of the Roman Empire, blocked their way. So 200,000 of them appealed to the Roman Emperor to let them in. And he did. They knew the risk. They were concerned about the risk. They disarmed all the warriors and they allowed them across the river. And this ended up leading to conflict, ethnic conflict, religious conflict, and it culminated 38 years later with Alaric the Visigoth sacking Rome. Despite the best of intentions, even the, the warmest welcome to refugees can lead to immense tragedy for even the most powerful empires. A lot of people say, well, what's, what's the problem? You know, there haven't been any serious problems. I mean, sure, you know, there's, there's some problems with rapes in Sweden. Sweden is dealing with a looming scandal with police accused of covering up mass sexual harassment. And, you know, some problems with a few little bombings here and there in Germany. But, you know, really, I mean, to talk about immigration leading to war, that seems a little bit of an exaggeration. After all, you know, the, the U.S. opened up its immigration significantly in 1965, and yet it's a relatively peaceful society still. But consider this. In 1882, the first Jews began settling in Palestine. Not long after that, the Zionist movement began in earnest, and in 1917, the British actually endorsed the Jewish homeland with the Balfour Declaration. By 1948, 33% of the population of Palestine was Jewish. And that was the year that the first Arab-Israeli war was fought. Now, obviously, the state of Israel has been established. 
Um, now the population of the, of the region is considerably more Jewish than it was. And we have seen 70 years of continuous war. Even when it starts with this very small population of immigrants, of refugees, with different traditions, different cultures, different languages, different religions, it usually will eventually lead to those people wanting to govern themselves in their own way. And since two different government systems and two different peoples cannot occupy the same place, that means that some level of conflict is inevitable. Now what's interesting when you compare immigration and war is that interestingly enough, war may actually be less of a problem. Think about it. The Germans managed to take over Paris twice. And yet France remained France. You know, a military occupation usually comes to an end eventually. But as an American Indian, I can attest, eventually the settlers never go home. Eventually it gets to the point where the native people are so conquered, the native people are so overrun that they completely lose their identity and are subsumed into the conquering peoples. Let me give you an example. The, the Golden Horde of Mongols that invaded Russia and subsequently Europe consisted of about 130,000 people. A million people immigrated into Europe last year. Operation Barbarossa, the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, was the largest military invasion of all time. It was 3.4 million people, but at 3.4 million people, it is considerably smaller than the number of people who have immigrated into Africa, into Europe, into the United States. Now here's where it gets particularly problematic. Look at Spain. Back in the year 711, under the Umayyad Caliphate, the Muslims invaded, and they invaded successfully with 25,000 soldiers. Not only did they manage to conquer most of Spain over time, but it took the Spanish 781 years to gradually push the Muslims back out of Spain. In 2016, 4% of the Spanish population is now Muslim. Praise be to Allah. Now, we don't know what's going to happen, but if it took them 700 years to reclaim their land, it doesn't seem to bode well for anyone to think that these populations are going to be able to coexist in peace. We also have the most troubling mass migration of all, which is of course the post-1965 immigration into the United States. The biggest mass migration in human history, the one that scholars consider to be the biggest movement of peoples in human history, is the division of Hindu India after the British left and the movement of Muslims into Pakistan and Hindus into India. About 14 million people ended up relocating. And that's considered by scholars to be the biggest mass migration in human history. But that's not true. The biggest migration in human history is the 130 million immigrants and descendants of immigrants who have entered the United States since 1965. So the post-1965 U.S. migration is nearly 10 times bigger than the one that is recognized as the biggest migration in human history. Is this going to lead to war? It seems likely. We don't know what form that war will take. We don't know how violent the conflict might become. We don't even know what the sides might be. But what we do know is that if we look at past migrations, that conflict is going to become a lot more likely once there is a group that is about a third of the population. A self-identified group that is about a third of the population that does not want to live by the same standards of government by the same laws, by the same language, by the same cultural tradition. You know, this is the danger. This is the problem. Even if 
there is no violent conflict. That the change that is taking place in government, the change that is taking place via democratic means, is actually the same result as if those 130 million people had come as conquerors bearing arms. Because at the end of the day, the result is the same. So we'll talk more about this in the future, but I hope that this is opening your eyes a little bit to looking at the consequences of today's events and learning to anticipate what's going to come in the future by looking at the reliable patterns of human behavior in the past. This is Vox Adversity. I'm Vox Day.